Hello and welcome to the second edition of the video journal of the Association of Spinal Surgeons of India. Taking evidence from research and publications to clinical practice is the motto of these journals. This time we've got Dr. Sajan Hegde, an ex-president of the Association of Spinal Surgeons of India and a dynamic spine surgeon from the Apollo Hospital in Chennai who is going to review the history as well as the research which went behind the advent and invention of vertebral body tethering technology, which is used to treat early onset spinal deformities. To that, Dr. Hegde has combined his experiences and I'm sure putting it all together will be extremely knowledgeable and useful for you. So welcome to this journal. I would also like this opportunity to welcome all of you to visit the website of the Association of Spinal Surgeons of India for more and more information regarding our activities. We also have a Facebook page, a Twitter handle, and we have a YouTube channel where all the webinars that ASSI has been doing are available as a link. These video journals will also be available over there as a link. So please do join ASSI for all the, our activities. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, essentially, I am going to expose my philosophy uh, that has guided me all these years. But today I would like to stick to the letter and spirit of the title of the talk that is research that has influenced me in the recent past. Talking about research, I do believe all research does contribute to a better understanding of disease and ultimately the treatment. But here we have a wonderful study which has very frequently been cited. But this research excites me a little less than the papers that I'm going to discuss today as I am going to refer to the papers which have a direct bearing to my thinking on how I treat a segment of my patients. So let me start from right in the beginning. You see, essentially, I, quintessentially, essentially, I'm a spine surgeon. I'm a surgeon. I like and embrace the challenge of stepping in where few have ventured before. But the path of a pioneer is a difficult one, as one has to fight dogma and wade through universally accepted traditions. So in the early 90s, when I was just starting off as a budding spine surgeon, and as you can see, this patient which I treated in those early days, in the early 90s, the patient has a kyphoscoliosis. Now in the, those days, deformity was assessed only with a frontal x-ray. No sagittal x-ray was done. Like in this patient, not just the frontal deformity, but also the kyphosis is of importance. And when I performed the first CD instrumentation, the Cottrell Dubusa instrumentation in India using segmental fixation, rigid fixation, correction of not just the frontal deformity, but also the restoring the sagittal alignment and giving a rigid fixation which allowed the patient to be able to get out of bed two days after a surgery, not wear a brace, go back to school in two to three weeks time. When I presented this in our spine conferences, I was met with a barrage of resistance. This was uh, in many ways, you know, there is a difficulty in accepting something new. And of course, people said that this, that is Cottrell Dubusa instrumentation, can never replace the gold standard, which in those days was the Harrington instrumentation, 
No doubt, it was the Harrington Rod which, assured, uh, which uh, led in the birth of modern age of spinal instrumentation. But was it the gold standard? In the last decade of the 20th century and the last decade of the century, an entire a group of spine surgeons from the US and from Europe made it their profession. And essentially everything that they did was correcting all these Harrington rods that had been placed in the 60s and 70s and that had led to sagittal imbalance. So it was, in my mind, I think it is difficult to accept to call it the gold standard. It had a number of issues. However, it, plays, it played an important role in the evolution of spinal instrumentation. So when I presented that child, I did feel a little bit of pushback. Also, we fast forward a few years, and in the early part of this century, there was a big discussion happening about how to treat the high-grade spondy. In those days, people felt it was too dangerous to reduce and it was not necessary to reduce and it was too difficult to reduce. So when I recommended correction of the lumbosacral kyphosis, correction of the reduc uh, complete reduction of the L5 or the sacrum and the creation of a load sharing interbody using a load sharing interbody device like a cage. This was alien in those days. In fact, till about a decade back, very few people were doing the classic TLIF procedure. So this was also very difficult for people to accept. And Again, I had to face a fair amount of pushback. So it is always the issue that a pioneer has when something new is done. There is always a problem in, in having it accepted universally. So it will be with the same, it will be the same with the technique that I will talk about in the next few minutes. This high-grade spondy finally got the recognition that it deserved when one of my junior fellows, ASSI fellow, Dr. Pramod Sudarshan, presented it at the International ISAS conference and got the Charles Ray Award for the best clinical paper. And this was, uh, uh, it came out in the International Journal of Spine Surgery in 2018. So finally it was accepted that reduction, high grade, uh, reduction of the high-grade spondylolysis in the young should and can be done. I will present now three cases for uh, everyone to see, and then we will discuss the treatment options. So here we have a 13-year-old child, perimenarchal. She is RISER 0 and a Sanders 4, which means she has a fair amount of uh, growth to happen. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is her x-ray uh, showing the deformity. Now, we will talk later about the options. And then finally, of course, about what I offer to my patients and why do I offer that. The second child is a seven and a half year old girl born of a consanguineous marriage with a spinal deformity that was noticed at one and a half years and the deformity was gradually progressive. The child had no neurological deficit on examination. So here we have the x-rays of the child. It's very evident. She has multiple hemivertebrae in the thoracic spine, spine and also a bar on the concave side. So this is perhaps one of those extremely malignant forms of congenital deformities, which will tend to progress very, very rapidly 
if not treated. So here you see the CT scan, you can observe, uh, appreciate the, the anomalies in the thoracic spine. And here you see the clinical pictures, which show that the child is very much out of balance with the truncal shift to the right and a hump on the right side already forming. So there, was, there were structural changes occurring in the thoracic spine and the ribs as well. Finally, there is the 13-year-old girl who presented with deformity in her lower back. Uh, her, children, uh, her parents noticed one and a half years back. The deformity was progressing. They tried alternative methods like exercise and yoga, which did not help her. On examination, as you can see here, she has a very severe uh, lumbar scoliosis with uh, the deformity extending into the pelvis. Her corpse angle measures 80 degrees and she has an apparent right limb shortening of six centimeters. When we see her lateral spine x-rays, we also notice that she has an asymptomatic grade two listhesis at L5 over S1. So let us now look at how the literature evolved, which inspired me to do what I did. Let's start right from the beginning. So here I start with the study done by the famous Peter Newton and his group way back in 2002. And they studied the asymmetrical flexible tethering of the spine growth in an immature bovine model. And they were able to understand that the, that the lateral bending motion could be controlled uh, with, with the tether. And, and that the tethering of the growing bovine sp uh, thoracic spine did alter the shape of the discs and spine element alignment. But this returned back to normal after removal of the tether. This study laid the basis for further studies to know the exact mechanism of growth modulation and the effect of tethering on disc function and integrity. The second study was by John Brown. This was in 2003. And he was able to create a progressive structural idiopathic type lordoscoliotic deformity with convexity to the right in the thoracic spine of an immature goat while maintaining the anterior and posterior elements of the spine along the maximal curve in a pristine state. He was able to show that using a posterior asymmetric tether in combination with uh, convex rib resection and concave rib tethering. So he was able to create an artificial scoliosis. This was a very important study. In 2005, he continued his, uh, his study, and here he created experimental scoliosis, which was, I mean, experimental scoliosis was created in goats and subsequently treated using shape memory alloy staples or anterior ligament tethers, which were attached to bone anchors. The study concluded that the flexible ligament tether demonstrated a greater efficacy and integrity than the more rigid shape memory alloy stable. So already we were creating a deformity, but we were also, after creating a deformity, we were able to correct it using a tether. The clinical relevance of this study lies in the, improve, lies in the improvement in fusionless implant design with a specific focus on optimizing the fixation to the bone. 
John Brown again followed it up with a study in 2006, and he was able to show that, th th that he could control progressive wedging at the apical spinal segments using the convex stapling procedure. That is, create the kind of deformities that used to occur in the uh, convexity in, in the most deformed part of any scoliotic spine. Peter Newton in, uh, reported in Spine 2005 when he studied in a bovine specimen and he was able to show that spinal growth modulation by temporary placement of a mechanical tether may provide ultimately a form of scoliosis correction that preserves intervertebral discs and flexibility. So here again, we are progressing in our basic studies to show the feasibility of correcting no, uh, using non-fusion techniques uh, for the spine. In 2008, JBJS, Peter Newton was able to show that multi-level flexible tether placement may provide a growth modulating mechanism for scoliosis correction while maintaining disc height, disc health. This is very, very important because the disc has to function normally even if it is fixed under a tether. Peter Newton again in 2008 was able to show that the tethered discs had similar water content to the control discs and did not show them or demonstrate gross morphologic changes of degeneration. So the long-term fate of these discs, even with the tether, was that they functioned like normal discs. And this helps in strategies for fusionless scoliosis correction would preserve disc health in adults and patients who will rely on these discs for decades after treatment. So after all these studies done in an animal models, in 2010, Larry Lenke and Dr. Charles Crawford presented the use of anterior tether in the correction of juvenile idiopathic scoliosis. It was a case report. This was perhaps the first case of a non-fusion anterior scoliosis correction. It was a five-year-old boy with a Cobb's angle of 25 degrees uh, with a right thoracic curve T6 to T12. And was diagnosed as juvenile idiopathic scoliosis. The Boston treatment had failed, Boston brace treatment had failed, and they did the anterior vertebral tethering. And this is the beginning of non-fusion scoliosis treatment. Amar Samdani, mainly working with Dr. Randy Betts, were in Philadelphia, they were the first to work on using clinical, uh, clin uh, clinical use of anterior vertebral tethering in the correction of idiopathic scoliosis. They presented their two-year result in 2014 September, and this was printed in Spine. And they said that that anterior VBT was a promising technique for skeletally immature patients uh, with idiopathic scoliosis. And that this technique could be safely performed and can result in progressive correction. So this was the first long uh, multiple patient use that was reported. They added a few more patients and in 2015, the same group was uh, followed up for a longer time and they were able to reveal the true benefits of this promising technique. 
Peter Newton, working with his group, was able to look at his patients at two to four years post-operatively, and he felt that the understanding of the parameters leading to success or failure will be critical in advancing reliable, definitive non-fusion treatment for progressive scoliosis in the future. And here is a study that is more recent, in fact, that has come in July 2020, which essentially uh, mirrors our experience. And they used uh, VBT in the early treatment for progressive scoliosis in pediatric patients. And they were able to get good success and their revision rates were, reasonable, were within reasonable limits. So they were able to show a good success of the VBT at two to five year post-operative results. So let's come back to our patients. Here we have a, that same 13 year old child who's premenarchal. What would be the treatment options? The treatment options would be to leave her alone and let her grow and say that when she is 14 or 15, uh, perhaps her deformity will be around 60 or 70, and that's the when we will do a definitive correction. Treatment B could be using a brace, which in India, in the humid conditions that, that we have, would be very difficult for a child to follow. So what would be the treatment options? What can we do for this child? Here are, are our Ben films. And this is what we have done. We growth modulated. As you can see, we have not fully corrected the spinal deformity. And you can see here that some residual deformity still persists. This is with the hope that as she grows, the spine will straighten on the concave side with the tether on the convex side and the deformity will correct further. Here you see her before surgery. This was immediately after surgery. Now you see her at two years follow up. You can see the spine is beautifully straightened and the trunk is beautifully balanced. There is a good sagittal alignment and you can see her shoulders perfectly balanced. Flanks are perfectly asymmetrical and she has an excellent correction and she has no scar on the back, just small incisions on the side. Let's come to our next case, the seven and a half year old child born of a consanguineous marriage. What are the treatment options for this unfortunate child? One could use, here you can see uh, on the traction film there is some degree of flexibility. Her uh, spine is correcting to 55 degrees. She has no cord abno abnormalities. We go back to the CT scan to show again the deformity and the hemivertebrae and the clinical pictures, uh, the, the, the effects it has on the child's mental status when you brace these child children long-term and whether you get cooperation from them. The second option is growth rods. That is standard growth rods or the magnetic rods or the shilla. The last option, is something out of the box. Let us look at the literature on growing rods. Here is a study that was done on growing rods for spinal deformity. And this was a study of all the top surgeons doing early onset scoliosis. You have Behrouz Akbarnia, you have George Thompson, you have Sukhan Shah, you have Paul Sponsella. And they all said that 
that that that the indicate that the indications to stop lengthening included a high incidence of complications, implant failures, curve progression, and failure to distract. So these were the number of complications that this top team experts in uh, early onset scoliosis had to face treating these patients with growth rods. And here's a paper from uh, China looking at the effects of growing rod treatment on the coronal balance. And they found that at, at an average, four surgeries had to be done till the patient went, underwent the final surgery for correction, which was uh, at when the child was uh, 12 to 13 years old. So about four surgeries. This is at the minimum. A look at the, at the experiences with magnetic rods. This team, which had a high, uh, high, level, of, high level of experience with magnetic rods, they had 75% revision rate, rod problems, proximal screw pullout, PJK, and they concluded that the, that the magic rods were not very promising. This study looked at the issues of, uh, with the metal work, and they felt that uh, the magnetic rods had a higher rate of complication than standard growth rods. And there was a fairly high incidence of unplanned return to the operation theater. So recently, the magic rods have been suspended in the UK due to safety concerns. So this way of treating congenital scoliosis is coming under a cloud. So what did we do for this child? We did something out of the box. We thought we would control the most, um, the, the most severe aspect of the deformity on the convex side with a non-fusion anterior scoliosis correction. And we would let the concave side continue to grow. So this is the preoperative. This is her immediately after surgery. And of course, because of the pandemic, they have not been able to travel from the Middle East. However, they were able to send the nine month follow up picture. And you can see here, she seems beautifully balanced. The story is not over for this child. We have to follow her till she is 12 years old. But we have not yet done any, any more surgeries except the first, first one. Perhaps there is still one more surgery which may be required when she finishes her growth. But we will know that only when she reaches age 12 or 13. But as of now, she is beautifully balanced. They were not caught in the pandemic. If I had done a growth rod, things would have gone, it would have been a disaster. They would have been caught in the Middle East, not being able to travel, no growth rod, resurgeries, and it would have been, it would have led to a, a very, very difficult outcome. And of course, with the growing rods, in this small child, you can always have issues with the proximal implants, PJK, as was mentioned earlier. Coming to our final uh, child, this is the 13-year-old child who has a very severe lumbar scoliosis. She, her cob angle measures 80 degrees. Now, look at her sagittal films, her spondy. She is fairly flexible. The standard treatment options would have been a posterior DA to L5, which would have left her uh, imbalance at the lumbosacral level. However, most surgeons perhaps would prefer to extend the fixation into the sacrum and into the ala. So here you have a young child in her teens who is a Bharatnatyam dancer 
and you tell her that you're going to change her life, correcting the spinal deformity, you will perhaps have an excellent X-ray to show with decent correction, though I don't think all posterior would work for her. And you would have made sure that she could never have done any gym activities or dancing for that matter, especially if you fixed her from D8 to the ELA. So that would have been end of her aspirations as a dancer. This is what we did. We had used the non-fusion uh, anterior scoliosis option and we corrected only her severe lung and you see her here. This is her pre-op. This is her post-surgery. And this is her doing Bharat Natyam at three months. So I wonder if you had fixed her to the sacrum at three months, she would be do, able to do all this. And it is very important that we remember that we, our children are not just the deformity, but individuals whose other aspirations have to be kept in mind when we undertake the treatment. And we, we have uh, sent our present study uh, to one of the major journals, journals and I hope it, we get a publication. And we have had excellent results. We have had no revisions. And we have had an excellent correction of right up to 71 degrees. And what is unique about our study is that we were able to do slightly older children who were more skeletally mature. And we had a mix of Lenke 1 and Lenke 5 type curves. And we were, a, we were the first study to evaluate the patient outcomes with the SRS 22. Let us see if we are able to get this in one of our journals. To conclude, my team and I have been extremely satisfied with the short-term results with non-fusion anterior scoliosis correction. In fact, it feels like deja vu. 30 years back, I was a greenhorn talking about a new exciting technique to treat scoliosis. And today I'm doing the same. But these are early days. Only time will tell if non-fusion will be a paradigm shift or just a flash in the pan. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.